Morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 12, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but, you know, I woke up early this morning, and I wanted to work on some other projects. started working on my slides, and before you know it, I'm two, three hours into working on the slides. So I promise you we have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me. But Pepsco, hey, you're out there. Come sponsor the show. Love to have you. Speaking of sponsors, this week's show is brought to you once again by Financial Juice. You like the juice? The juice is good. Follow me there, www.financialjuice.com. Dave Landry. I'm kind of backed up on projects and all, so I haven't had a chance to work with the fine gentleman over there, but um, looks like they got a pretty good crew. I'm looking forward to uh, doing some work with them, but you can follow me there, financialjuice.com slash Dave Landry. Mm, good stuff. And there's a big news aspect. I'm not a huge fan of the news, as you know, but it, um, it's also social media for the financial markets, which is kind of cool. All right, I guess we got to talk about this disclaimer screen. I could read it to you, but be quicker to just sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor, throw me a bone. I won't spend too much time on this, I promise. But uh, the reason I ask, or one of the reasons, I mean, other than for obvious reasons, is that um, some people review their reviews, and that kind of, um, I don't know, it kind of aggravates me that these people could be that malignant. So read the book, and if you don't like it, say so. I mean, somebody has said so up there. They said it was too much work. Well, it is a lot of work. Okay, you didn't uh, you didn't become a doctor by uh, reading the book or reading half a book and starting the next day, did you? Or an automatic transmission mechanic? All right, what are we talk about? Well, now's the time to dust off all my material on what to do when things get iffy now it'll make a lot more sense in a minute um one thing i woke up thinking about this morning is and i was thinking about it yesterday quite a bit i was in a webinar and after the webinar i was on a panel and the panelist was um dave mecklenburg uh he's over at tiger shark dot trading and art collins art collins is a mechanical trader but i listened to his presentation and i really enjoyed it and uh, he touched upon a lot of things that apply to also discretionary trading such as people set their stops too tight and people are looking for in general people are looking for some sort of um, I don't want to use the word magic bullet but they are they're looking for some sort of high percent correct methodology and they're forgetting that the ultimate goal is to make money and not be right you could have a very high percent methodology but the only way you're going to get that to work is to take little bitty profits. And trust me, something bad can and will always happen to you. And if you take a little bitty profits and you're doing good, you feel like you got a little money-making machine, and then you get whacked, well, it might erase six months' worth of gains or ten months' worth of gains or maybe even a whole year or more. Or Unfortunately, you could blow up. And trust me, I've been around this game long enough. I've seen it quite a bit. Speaking of game, uh, I do want to talk again about the outliers and the importance of outliers, and um, I'll probably go off, off on a few tangents there because there's, there's some psychology involved with that, but we'll get to that in one second. And uh, IPO bull market, still not dead yet, so we got another report on that. also have a little discretionary um, thing to talk about here real quick. Uh, as you know, a few weeks back, we talked about the um, USO, made a nice little run off the bottom, a nice little um, pullback in here. Gave us an entry of here and a stop of here. Looks like the mother of all bottoms was in place. Or it looked like a small bottom was in place at least. Uh, and you can see, as I said, quite a few, uh, quite a bit. There's the big trend here, which is still down. But the little trend is beginning to um, turn back up. So that is a good thing. Okay. Let me just shut down. I've got some email windows that are popping up emails. Okay. Now, let's look at what happened. Okay. Well, we had a stop at 750. And yesterday it went to 1744. Okay. So it went six cents below the stop. Well, 
I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. And when it's down here, I think, oh, Dave, what should I do? Should I get out of the trade? It's like, yeah, of course get out of the trade. But if the stock just barely nicks your stop, and the litmus test for that is if you draw a line on your chart and you got to squint your eyes to see the stop, or if your line is wide enough to where it doesn't even stick out below the line, then it's just a stop nick. And it's so funny. It's like uh, this might be the exact low, this 1744, and this thing might take off and we might see $32 um, USO. It might double from here. And somebody will say, well, Dave, why didn't you just set your stop at 1744 to begin with? I'm like, well, nobody's that good. It's like we had one nick the stop, hit the exact stop a while back, and then it took off, went up three, four hundred percent from that level, maybe even more. I forget exactly where it went. But and somebody said well, your stop was at nine, and and they said, well, why didn't you set the stop at eight ninety nine? It's like, well, nobody's that good, okay? You take an educated guess about where the stop should be, and you realize you, you're going to be off a little bit. There's a little variance involved. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but I'm guessing that would that's um that's what it is. So if you are disciplined, set your alarm right around here somewhere. Okay. Don't sit there and watch the screen all day. I would cost you against that because that's just gonna ruin your life. And you'll do a lot of stupid things. But set your alarm close to where the stop is. So you know that you might need to pay a little bit of attention. And if you see it get nicked, watch it for a few minutes. If it gets nicked and it turns right back around, then maybe put the stop in a little bit lower below that and then go about your life. The other thing you could do, and I'd be careful with this, but just make sure you're going to get that alarm. But maybe have an airbag in place way down here, okay? And I stole that term from, I think, Trading Chaos. I don't remember liking the book, but I do like the term. So if I get one good thing out of a trading book, it's worth reading. Um, no offense to the gentleman that read, uh, wrote Trading Chaos. I just like to trade what I think is order in the markets. Anywho, um, so if you set an airbag and then you set a alarm, and you get an alarm, okay, you won't get taken out. The airbag is there just in case, just in case you're uh, incapacitated or whatever. At the time the alarm comes in, unless it keeps dropping, well, you can take it out. But you'll still be able to live to fight another day. But say you are there. It's like, okay, well, wait a minute. I might have to get out. Let's see what happens. Oh, it turns right back up, up. You can leave that airbag in place. Maybe put a new alarm in down here somewhere or something. There, There's a lot of things you could do. So do whatever you think is right for you. Now, any questions on discretion? I've covered it quite often. Um, it does take discipline. And if you're not disciplined, sometimes you're better off just leaving your stop in place at the mechanical stop, wherever we determine that that stop is, should be mechanically, okay? But if you're willing to apply a little bit of discretion, you could do quite well. And if you could stay with one trade, and if that trade turns into an outlier, which we're going to talk about in, in great detail in just a few minutes, then it makes it all worthwhile. Now, one thing as I was putting all my slides together this morning, I noticed is that um, the IPO, or I've been noticing, and I've been saying this for quite a few weeks, the IPO in the bull markets, I'm sorry, the bull market in IPOs is not dead yet. There's lots of flies and dies, so money management remains crucial. I don't know if I need to that needs to come out probably. But by fly and die, if you had the IPO course, just bear with me while I explain this to everyone else. Fly means the IPO takes off, and then die means it didn't dies out. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about the whys behind this. The whys aren't important, but sometimes the whys help to get your head around things. You've got venture capitalists back here. This is a BPO before public offering. And you've got insiders, and you've got people with sweat equity that uh, got paid a bunch of stock and not a whole lot of money, and they might need to pay that mortgage on their house, or they might have a kid come along or a kid going to college. Um, you know, as you guys know, kids could be a tremendous money suck. Um, but they're wonderful. 
Anyway, so there's a lot of people looking to get off the hook back here, as I explained in the IPO course, okay? And there's also a reality that becomes realized, and I call it the rotten reality realized, and I was making a reference back to the fact that we're trading sardines, okay? I'm not going to tell a sardine story. There's not enough time. But I think most of you know it. Um, so the reality begins to set in, and it's not a good reality, so it dies out. But the thing you have to realize is, so what? You can still make a lot of money in the fly phase. And it just kind of, and I was kind of thinking this morning, and I get a little philosophical now and then, obviously. But sometimes it's like, you make money on a trade, you make good money on a trade, you get knocked out at a profit, so long it takes for all the fish. Well, you go on and you try to find the next opportunity, you just move on. And that's that's a wonderful thing. It's like you get it's like you're getting cycles in and you're getting good cycles and you're or you're getting reps, however you want to look at it. And that could be a really good thing. Now we'd all like to get into these stocks and ride out the trend for years and years and years, and every now and then it happens. Not that long. We'll talk about the outliers in one second. So, so what? You can make a lot of money in this fly phase, but just make sure you have a stop ready. Here's an example. This was one that uh, came out. Uh, this is a recommendation that came out of the IPO course. It's a little breakout pattern that we're trading here. I'm not going to give you the exact pattern, but you smart people here might be able to reverse engineer it. And what happens? You trail a stop up and you get knocked out. Okay? So be it. It's better than poke at the eye. I mean, this from here to here. I have to look at the spreadsheet, but it was a pretty decent gain with the uh, profit taken along the way. So, so what? And the thing to realize is this all unfolded on, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, less about two weeks, okay? So this is like a two-week trade, and it paid off really nice. If you could do that every two weeks, you would own the world. So there's nothing wrong with these flies and dies, you just have to use some pretty serious money management. It takes a lot of discipline. Um, we were talking yesterday, and we talked a little bit about psychology after the webinar in the panel. And one of the things that kind of came up, and it sounded a little weird, and after I said it, like, oh, should I have said that? But I got to thinking about it, and it makes a lot of sense. It's like sometimes when I am placing a trade or taking profits or putting that stop in, especially taking profits because that's a little bit more active type of thing. I feel like I have an out-of-body experience. Um, and I don't know how to explain it other than that. I find my hand being forced. It's almost like someone's grabbing my hand and forcing it and placing that trade to get out at the market once that initial profit target is hit or to place a stop so I'll get knocked out at a profit and then I'll exit by the end of the day. But it's like when I'm taking those profits, it's almost like this out-of-body experience where I'm making the trade and then after the trade is made, it almost takes me a few minutes to kind of like realize what did I do? And and that's the only way I can explain it is like an out-of-body experience because I think I feel those inner, and I hate to use the word demons, but for lack of a better word, thinking, oh, well, let's just let's just hang on and let's just see and, and, and let's try to make as much money as possible as opposed to doing the right thing and taking that profit. And if it's a really good-looking setup, it's like I'll find myself putting my orders in, and then afterwards I'll go, what did I just do? And then realize that, oh, I did I did the right thing. Because we're all – I don't think it ever goes away with the human nature. Okay, because just because you decide you want to be a trader doesn't mean you no longer have a pulse, as I say quite often. So even after you've been doing this for a while, you're still faced with some of those psychological issues. But you do get more and more, and for lack of a better word, flip it uh, with things. It's like, oh, okay, I lost at a trade. All right, F, that, that sucks. Uh, okay, let's find another trade. And you become very matter-of-fact about it all. Now, let me interview myself. Do drawdowns still suck? Yes. Uh, does it suck when the market goes sideways and chops around for months on end? Yes. Do you feel like, oh, maybe there's something else I could do? Yeah. I mean, these are all 
human emotions, but if you can stick to a system, whatever system that is, provided it's viable longer term, it doesn't have a blowout characteristic, then you'll do just fine. Okay, now I've digressed a little bit in here, but my point is that something like the fly and die, I don't look at this and say, wow, I could have got 30 bucks a share and I only got 25 or 24 or whatever it is. I'm, I'm thinking, I look at the, the, the bottom line and say, did that one work? Yes. Next. Okay. Did that trade work? Yes. Next. Okay. Did that trade not work? Yes. Next. So you get stopped out, move on. Okay. Oh, by the way, one thing that came up yesterday was like, well, how do you stick with these positions longer term? And it's like, well, if you got a stop in place, turn your monitor off. Watching that monitor all day is not going to do you any good, okay? What you might do, though, is you might put some alarms in and get some alarms only if and only if you need to take some action. All right, let's get back to this IPO bull market. I knew I would, I knew I would go off on tangents. Uh, the demarcation has increased, and, and this is really a good thing. And they seem to either fly or they seem to either die. And this is where uh, Will Rogers comes in to play. And Will Rogers a long time ago said, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, he was making a joke about this. But if you take this literally, it sure makes a lot of sense. And this is especially true when it comes to IPOs. It's, it's true when it comes to waiting for an entry on a trade too. But with the IPOs, you want to buy the ones that are going up and avoid the ones that are going down. Now, here we have a good example of a nice stock. We're, we're long this one, currently long this one here. But notice so far, now it's going sideways, consolidated a little bit here and there, but so far it's worked its way higher. Here's another one, a little wide and loose. You have to give them a fairly wide berth, but so far so good. You can see this one's doubled in value. Uh, yet another one just on its way higher, about 50% higher so far. Okay. Uh, here's one's actually set up. It's pretty thin, so, so consider yourself warm. But you can see if you were trading a little breakout pattern in here, okay, you'd have got long somewhere in here or maybe even a little earlier, depending on which, which pattern you're trading. And, and if you miss that one, you got the first pullback, which could be a very powerful pattern, okay? Now, here's another example of, or here is, is an example of a die. Notice that it came public here, but what happened? It just died, okay? And now it's down here towards new lows. So what do you do with this stock? Well, my first rule is... You can't buy any IPO until you have at least one week's worth of trading. I think anything before one week's worth of trading is complete gambling. If you want to gamble, that's fine. I'd rather go to Vegas and gamble. That's what, that way a little pretty girl will uh, bring me a drink, you know, or I can have a pretty girl in my arm. I'll bring my wife, okay, just in case she's listening. <laughs> no, she doesn't let me go to Vegas without me. Without her, she trusts me though. I'm a good boy. All right, here's another example. Now this one did kind of shoot up initially, okay? So you're thinking, oh, I missed the boat on that. Well, so what, okay? You can't kiss all the women. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five days worth of trading, and then as you can see, it died out, okay? Here's another one. This is when I did one of my IPO follow-ups. Uh, it's, it's a pattern I call buy at B, and my entry was at 1775. Notice that the first day of trading was the all-time high, and so far, this thing has just died out, okay? Now, I'm showing you a lot of these die and dies because in order to pick the best stocks, you have to avoid as many stinkers as possible. So here's yet another example, and you can see you got first two days of trading, and then that's the all-time high. Then it begins to implode, okay? And here's yet another one. So there are some that are taking off now, 
there are a few that are setting up. Um, I find the demarcation has become much greater, though, and that's good. Like I said, they're either flying or they're dying, okay? And one thing I've noticed a little bit lately is that if they're not flying or dying, they're just chopping around and going sideways, and there's no trade there either, okay? Now, one thing I was thinking about based on yesterday's webinar is that we are playing a game of outliers when we're trying to catch that longer term trend. And uh, Art Collins was talking about percent correct and, and he kind of mentioned longer term systems and I've done a lot of research and programming early on on mechanical based systems and did some, actually did some consulting where I would program for others and uh, on top of that programming, I wouldn't just take what they gave me verbatim, but I would say, well, this doesn't work, but it looks like if you tweak this a little bit, it will. And I'd go in there and kind of mess around with a lot of the parameters and see, without curve fitting too much, just see if there was a logical way to make the uh, idea work. And I learned a lot about trading from the process. So it's like I'm anti-mechanical. But it sort of made me who I am. I mean, I've had some bad experiences trading. I've had some bad experience with hedge funds. And it's like, I wish they wouldn't have happened, but it's made me who I am. And, and that's, how, that's how life is. Some stuff's going to happen to you. Some bad stuff will happen to you. But live through it and move on. And, you know, I don't want to sound like Nietzsche or anything, but what doesn't destroy you will make you stronger, provided you're willing to learn from those mistakes and those bad things. And one thing I learned through all the system testing is that it is a game of outliers, and the percent correct is going to be very, very low if you have a longer-term trend-following system. It's going to be a little higher with a short-term system, and your risk is going to be a little lower, but you're not going to make enough, okay? So it is a game of outliers, and most people can't live with that because they want, to, they, they want to be correct as much as possible. If you were a doctor and you were only correct about 50% of the time, okay, now you're kind of thinking, well, just flip a coin 50-50, right? Well, a little bit more complicated than that when it comes to the markets, but if you were only Let's say you do have a longer-term trading system, and you're about 50-50 on your trades, which is actually pretty high. It's actually down in the low 20s to capture those longer-term trades, back from what I recall from the system testing. But if half your patients died, you'd be out of business real soon. But in trading, you might be wrong more than half the time. It's like you have to get used to being wrong, okay? So it is this game of outliers. Now, an outlier... In statistical terms, and I don't know exactly how they defined it, but you have this little bell curve thing, and they call it the fat tail and all, but your outliers are going to be out here somewhere, okay, out towards the, I guess they call this the tail of the curve. And this is like, I don't want to show how little I know about statistics, and statistics are worthless, 73.4%, I think, of all people know that. But the bell curve basically says that everyone should be somewhere within this curve, okay? Um, you know, I, was, I don't want to digress too far, but I was at a, a, a business once, and they were explaining the job reviews, and they used the bell curve, and they, and they basically, they actually admitted, they said, well, everyone should fit within, you know, bad people over here, then we got some, some, uh, excellent performers here and then some over here. It's like they actually said that they adjust whether you get a good or very good or excellent or whatever based to fit the bell curve. And I'm like, why would you actually tell the employees that? It's like, why bother even try? But I digress. But anyway, a lot of things do fall within a bell curve, um, anything almost in life, except for trading, of course, okay? Uh, trading is not statistically based. But your outliers are going to be somewhere out here. You can have these big moves, okay? Another way of calling a, an outlier 
was uh, Tlaib wrote a book about the black swan. And the black swan is, is just because you've never seen a black swan doesn't mean that they don't exist. I don't know how many double negatives I use there, okay? If you've never seen one, they might still exist. You've just never seen one, okay? And his point is that these, these adverse outliers occur more than they should statistically in markets. And he has a very valid point to make. Um, I find the book kind of negative, but I think that it should be required reading for everyone. At least you should wrap your head around those concepts of the black swan, uh, something like long-term capital management. They were a victim of the black swan. They thought that they had this massive arbitrage thing that was just a little money maker, and they didn't realize the true risk of what they were doing. Um, I've told the story before. I think I've said his name, but I don't know whether I should say it or not. But he was a, a friend of mine was explaining to me they were following a system, and it basically said that they should buy like two billion dollars worth of T bills based on the system. Well, this fund was nowhere near that big. And even though it's T-bills, okay, you're thinking, well, what could go wrong in T-bills? Well, something could happen. You don't know. Something bad could happen. Some glitch could happen. And so he immediately pulled the plug to make sure that trade didn't get executed and, and pulled the size way down, okay? So black swans can still happen. And, and that's where people who sell options, they really get their – Oh, I can't. I hate to say this. A tits in a ringer, uh, because and I've seen stuff work for a long, long time and then blow up. And they get into a lot of trouble because they don't fully think that a market could do what it's doing. Like let's say 2008, for instance. You've got puts on the S and P that are so far out of the money. There's no way in heck that it will ever hit that strike. So you start selling puts on the S&P, right? Then what happens? We have one of the worst bear markets in history, the last 100 years, okay, almost. One of the worst bear markets in the last 100 years. Well, guess what? Those puts went up astronomically, and they you got bit by that outlier, and that's one way to blow up. Uh, by the way, selling options – is a great way to have a very brilliant but brief career on Wall Street. So people who sell options for years often don't realize that just because they didn't blow up doesn't mean that they can't blow up. Now, I have a friend, and I haven't spoken with him in years, but Joe Calandro, he's a former CTA, Commodity Trading Advisor, and he was a Commodity Trading Advisor right around the time that I was I started by CTA, and I was a CTA for about 14 years. I don't know if Joe is still a CTA or not. But he actually pointed out that we're actually looking for that outlier. We're looking to play that outlier. And I think it was Joe. I'm pretty bad about giving proper credit <laughs> where it's due. It's just I meet a lot of people in this industry. But uh, I'll give it to Joe. But we're actually looking to play that outlier. Okay? So we're sort of black swan hunting. We're not trying to avoid the black swan. We're actually looking to catch it. So while others are trying to avoid the black swan, we're actually looking for them. And, again, black swan hunting. I was on a plane back from Italy, and I was kind of bored, and I got to thinking about the black swans. And I actually took some notes down about black swan hunting and, and wondering if that could be some fodder for additional research. Now, I'm doing this through patterns right now, through my patterns, through my setups, looking for um, – Inefficient moves in efficient markets, meaning that like a bow tie or a first thrust and something like Forex or whatever. I'm also doing this through stock selection and this IPO thing. If you're trading some of these IPOs, if they come public and you're watching them and the ones that die you avoid are the ones that look like they're beginning to fly, you jump on. Well, sooner or later, you're going to catch it right. And you're going to catch a few of those big, huge winners, and that could make your year. Speaking of making your year, that's the, that's the tough part for the trend following, 
okay, is that one or two outliers can make you a whole year. Now, I don't want to make it sound like that it's impossible to catch, capture these outliers, but you do have to work at it, okay? And, again, it's not impossible, but it's something that I haven't solved for and probably never will, okay, being that the importance of the outlier and obviously on every trade you want it to go up four or five hundred percent, but it won't, okay? So money management is key. And just remember that every trade, no matter how well thought, has the potential to become a losing trade. As I often say, I'll see a setup and I'll, I'll just know it's going to do great, and it'll do great, okay? And then I'll slip up and say that and say, yeah, I knew from the start this was going to be a, a great one. And people in the service are like, well, Dave, why don't you tell us ahead of time? It's like, well... Every now and then I think that, and it doesn't work, okay? And it's like, wow, okay, just reality check. No matter how great a trade looks, every now and then one might not work, and sometimes more than one, okay? Uh, Tom McClellan, Tom's got an interesting background. His, uh, his, his father, Sherman, and his mother, Marion, and uh, Marion's no longer with us, rest in peace, uh, were, and I, I don't know the exact story, and I have to, next time I see Tom, I'll ask him, but it's my understanding that they were farmers and they were looking to get the best price on crops and they began studying the markets and they had this affinity for technical analysis because they were his parents were both mathematicians. And when Tom spoke last year at the American Association of Professional uh, Technical Analysts Conference, Tom was talking about um, the fact that when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship between you and the company and he went on to say, but most people fail to realize is that you're also forming a relationship with anyone else who has ever bought the stock. And those people will screw you, okay? So you buy a stock, and you think it's a good stock. And if you're using fundamentals, you know, God bless you, whatever. You know, that's what makes the market, right? Or if you've got some great look of technicals, you're like, you know what? This stock looks great. It's got Dave Landry's pattern here, so I'm going to jump all over It looks fantastic. I even emailed Dave on it. He said, yeah, I think it looks great too, okay? And the company's doing well. The company looks good. They're in a promising field. You know, add up everything. It all looks good. Well, anyone else who owns that stock might decide willy-nilly to sell that stock, and that could be the catalyst for a sell-off of the stock, okay? So it could also be something like a hedge fund could blow up. Or something bad could always happen, right, to someone in the stock. So I talked to Tom a while back, and I said, Tom, i got to tell you, I've, I've been quoting you for the last year on this uh, former relationship with the company and these, everyone else has bought the company. And he goes, well, i got one. I'll take that one step further. And this is what my mother said. Everyone uses timing in their investing. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money, while others use methods that are more sophisticated. And if you think about that, that makes a lot of sense, okay? People get divorced, they sell the stocks to pay off their spouse. My friend Dick Fruth over at Houston, Texas, he's a money manager over there, and when he started in business, people actually – had shares, the actual paper shares of a stock. And when they come into his office to sell the stock, they would hand him the shares. And, and, and Dick's a very curious individual. Instead of just taking the paper and processing it, being on your, you know, go about your way, he'd actually form a relationship with these people and say, well, why are you selling? Tell me what's going on. And rarely did anyone ever say that the company – uh, is no longer good, it's a bad company, nine out of ten times, or I don't know exactly how many, but quite often I should say, well, I'm getting a divorce. Well, I'm thinking about buying a new car. Um, I met this girl, and I don't want anybody else to have her, so I have to have her, so we're getting married. Okay, Or we're having a baby, got some kids going to college. Now, what does that have to do with the company? Absolutely nothing, okay? So realize that, as Tom says, those people will screw you. So you've got to have a stop in place. And my 
tagline, which I stole from, I'm not name dropping, I just, you know, I just get a lot of good information from these people. But I stole it from Greg Morris, Is all predictions about the future, a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. Now, I think I made a pretty good case for why you need to stop on a trade, okay? Never forget that a good offense is often your best defense. Pick the best stocks to begin with. I was asked that yesterday. How do you stick? How do you stick with trades? How do you get the money management right? How do you do all these things? Well, the psychology even more important. Like, how do you deal with the psychology of all this? Well, if you do your homework and you're the best stocks to begin with, the chances of you catching that outlier are much, much, much better. Okay, you still have to use a stop, but. If you have a good offense, that's often your best defense. So if you're winning on stocks, and I don't want to get into percentages because that's where everybody gets uh, tripped up, but if you're getting some nice big winners, okay, and that is mitigating, not only mitigating, but even giving you um, more profit than your losers, so net-net, you're making money, it's much easier to follow that plan, okay? And you're much better, you're gonna your chances of catching that outlier are much, much better. Okay. So again, your best defense is often a good offense. Pick the best to begin with. Pick the best of the best. Okay. So just a couple things. I mean, I spent 14 hours on this when I did the course, but just a few things, and I touched upon some of these yesterday. Uh, ask yourself, isn't it a solid trend or is it an emerging trend? Well, a solid trend, you should be able to draw a big arrow like that. Okay. Now keep a, keep an eye on the scaling. So make sure this isn't like a five point move over like uh, six months in the stock. Okay, that's not that big of a deal. Okay, based on the volatility of the stock. But if it's a decent move in here, based on the volatility of the stock, then you might just have a bona fide uptrend. Or is it an emerging trend? Is the stock kind of meandered its way lower? And then all of a sudden, it's beginning to take off from lows, okay? So could it be a new emerging trend? Is there overhead resistance above the stock? So let's say you got a nice little low-level setup. Looks pretty good. Let me draw like a cup and handle, okay? Cup and handle could be like a bow tie or first thrust or something, okay? Now, if it's got a whole bunch of trading right here, then guess what? Those are the people that will screw you because they're doing what? They're looking, down, looking to get out of break even. So stock might rally up a little bit, hit this overhead resistance. Now, if you're in a stock and there's nothing above it, okay, then everybody's happy. Then the sky's the limit, right? So make sure there's clear sky above. Uh, if you're looking at an established trend, has the trend persisted, okay? Meaning does the stock tend to go up day after day after day after day after day? The more I talk about persistency, the more important I think the concept is. Mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression, where you could just draw a line, or yeah, I should say, you could just draw a line through as many of the bars as possible. And if you can intersect nearly all the bars, then you know the trend is persistent. Is it volatile enough? Okay, um, that's part that comes into the efficiency versus the inefficiency characteristic. If the stock has moved significantly or demonstrated in the past that it can move significantly, then it might be volatile enough to actual trade, okay? Uh, does it trade cleanly? And this is where I talk about this is what a clean stock looks like, stair steps higher, nice persistent moves, rinse and repeat. This is what a stock looks like that's electrocardiogram, okay? This bad, this good, like Frankenstein, Tarzan speak, right? Uh, also, what is the market doing? What is the sector doing? What are other stocks within the sector doing? This is very important here. I can't emphasize this enough. Always look at, if you've got a little semiconductor and you really like it, well, go look at all the other tradable semiconductors. Tradable meaning that the volume is high enough, okay, and the volatility is, is high enough to trade. So go in and look at those other ones. And are there any sexy sisters or brothers, however you want to look at it, that look better than your setup? If there is, then take them. And then also make sure that there's plenty of other stocks within the sectors, within the sector that confirm what you're seeing, okay? So you're swimming with the tide, okay? And even if you don't pick the best of the best stock, okay, 
then the, the rising tide is probably going to to lift your boat, okay? Or you'll you'll go along with the tide, I should say, and you're not going against flow. Now, in rare cases, sometimes you'll have the mother of all stocks within a sector, and the setup just looks fantastic. So what do you do? You take it, okay? That's the that's the ultimate litmus test. If you like a setup, then you take it, okay? But in general, you want to make sure you have as much confirmation as possible, especially when you're first starting out. When you're first starting out, you probably only want to trade one pattern. Oh, gee, what's that one pattern? Well, I would say persistent pullbacks combined with TKO. So that's sort of two patterns, but ideally persistent pullbacks only would be your, your only pattern. And if some of them, if they have a TKO within the pullback, that's even better. Okay, and I think that's probably the best thing you should do, which you, that's how you should start trading. Because you're not going to get that many trades, it's going to force you to be selective in and of itself. Okay, so start there and then build. And then, you know, shameless plug here, watch and rewatch the stock selection course. I get a few questions on the course uh, from people who have taken it, and based on the people that have taken it and rewatched it and rewatched it. The same thing holds true for the IPO course. I put a lot into those things, many hours and hours into them, and then there are actually a lot of hours that it of themselves. And the people that have watched them two or three times have come back to me and said, you know what, every time I watch this, I get something else. And when people who have only gone through them, let's say, once, and they're asking me questions about stocks, I'm like, okay, well, obviously the stock has some overhead resistance. It has this going wrong, this going wrong. Go back and rewatch. And sometimes it's a beautiful setup. Uh, it's a beautiful setup, except that notice that it uh, really it had some problems back here in the chart, okay? And then I'll say go back and rewatch the the course. So anyway, if you're interested in the course, here's the um, information down here. I have unlimited lifetime support. It doesn't mean you call me up and say, hey, Dave, I'm working on a trading system to help me out. What it does mean, though, is like, okay, I like this stock. This is why, blah, blah, blah. You tell me all your reasons. You tell me where you're going to get in, where you're going to place a stop. You tell me the whole nine yards, and then I'll give you my opinion on that stock, okay? And within reason. If you do it ten times a day, then there's just not enough hours in a day to keep up but a limited support within reason and you should the reason I do that is because if you watch it two or three times you shouldn't have that many questions okay and I know a question comes up every now and then that's why I do support it all right let's uh, any questions about, I know kind of a ramble big surprise huh any questions about anything covered so far let me just get through this and then we'll hop out to the charts so what do you do when things get iffy Things have gotten a little iffy as of late, as you know. Well, the first thing you want to do is breathe. Breathing is important, no matter what you do. If you're learning how to juggle, breathe. <laughs> My daughter came home a while back, and uh, one of her little friends decided he wanted to juggle, and um, she came home. I want to juggle, too. So, all right, well... I could actually juggle a little bit. I did years ago. But the thing she wasn't doing was breathing. She got You got to breathe. When she first started playing guitar, she didn't breathe. It's like, breathe, breathe. So you, it's amazing how much, how important breathing is. So never forget to keep breathing. Okay? And then continue to follow your plan. If you don't have a plan, then you shouldn't be trading anyway. So have a plan. So the point about breathing is, don't do anything drastic, okay? And I talked about outliers, and I probably could talk about outliers in another two or three hours. We just kind of scratch the surface there. But if you miss a few of those outliers, it's the difference between a mediocre year and a fantastic year, okay? And that's one of the hardest parts for me to to deal with because I, I do, I don't want to say I care too much because that sounds like BS, but I do. I probably care too much. And I, I get upset when people can't follow along and when people take my stuff and they're not successful with it. And 
you know, they'll say, well, I almost did everything. It's like, well, that's the problem. You didn't do everything. And just missing a few of those big trades, I don't want to make it sound too elusive, but it is vitally important that you do capture a few outliers here and there. And sometimes you get lucky to capture more than a few, but you have to position yourself so that these positions are allowed to turn into longer-term winners, in other words, outliers. So you see the market getting a little iffy. You're long a half a dozen stocks. What do you do? Well, a lot of people think, you know what? I'm out. I, last time this happened, I lost money. I'm out. Well, four or five of those positions might stop out, but one position might defy gravity. You might have a little biotech in there, and um, I don't know what, the, what example to use. Let's just say Ebola shows up again. And this biotech has uh, a vaccine they're working on for Ebola, okay? And the stock doubles and triples from there. And that one little stock would have made your entire year, okay? But if you get nervous every time the market gets a little iffy and bail out on everything, you're never going to get that big winner, that big outlier. So that's the importance of that. And that's why we don't bail out on everything. We've had some pretty serious market spills over the last few years. And most of them are, are – most of the spills took us out of most of our stocks. But every now and then, we kept a few stocks throughout the spill that have actually gone on to go up 100 percent at even 200 percent. If we would have exited at the first signs of adversity, either within the stock within itself or the overall market, then we would have micromanaged ourselves out of those good positions. So you have a stop. You have a plan. Follow your plan. Let the stops take you out. Let the stop keep you in, okay? I can't beat the dead horse too much. It is a game of outliers. So if you stick with your stops, leave the stops in, and the market begins to roll over, yeah, it might take you out of all your stocks, but it might keep you in that one big stock that's important, okay? Now, be selective, okay? Is this rally the greatest, is this really the greatest setup in setup town? Okay, ask yourself that. Could I pass and live with myself? And that means, the reason I said it that way is, trading like life is, is making decisions and then living with them, okay? Making decisions is pretty easy. Living with them is not. I often make a joke at my wife's expense. She used to laugh at it. She doesn't like me saying it too much anymore. But making a decision to marry the most beautiful woman I ever met was pretty darn easy. Living with her is not. But that's it. We actually have a good relationship. We hang out a lot. Well, she's my best friend. But you get the idea. It's very easy to make a decision. And it's hard to live with that decision. I saw somebody recently, they were, uh, I thought they were just getting married a couple of months ago and they were divorced. It's like, well, evidently living, <laughs> living with that decision was a little tougher than, than making it, right? So you have to make a decision, say, okay, I'm going to buy this stock and then I'm going to live with it, good, bad, and, or indifferent. A stop will take you out. A stop will keep you in. It's that simple, okay? Whether you cry and cuss and fuss and pull the stop out and let it go to zero or whatever, all these things, it, it, the stock's going to do what it's going to do. But if you let yourself get stopped out, you could move on, live the fight another day, okay? Or it might keep you in, and then you end up with a big winner. It's Again, it's that simple. I never said it was easy, okay? But it's simple. Uh, so is the potential reward worth my small risk, okay? Um, I kind of see, like, okay, anytime I put a trade on, it's like, okay, I know I'm risking this much of my account on that trade. Now, do I have the potential to make this much? If the answer is yes, then you take it, okay? Just always ask yourself and realize that you're going to lose that much here and there, okay? You will, be, you will have losses. I probably spent too much time talking about losses. If I just talk more about, if I talk more about this, I'd probably make a lot more money on the educational side 
of my business. But the reality is you will have some losses. So can you make that decision to live with it? Either the decision to take the stock and have a potential loss or to avoid the stock and avoid catching a potential gain. Okay, So it really has to be a great setup. You're going to find as you mature in your career, you're going to find yourself taking less and less and less and less setups. And in my trading service where I feel a little pressure to put some product out there, to put some setups out there, I, I don't do it. I don't, I don't succumb to that pressure. And I've had people quit. It's not active enough. Like, what do you mean it's not active enough? There's nothing to do. The market is chopping sideways. It's not going anywhere. There are no setups. Why do I want to be trading? Go. You want to, You want some excitement? Go do something fun. Okay. It's gonna be a heck of a lot cheaper than looking for the market to entertain you. Now, here's the thing: if things are beginning to, to implode a little bit, ask yourself: Is it time to nibble on the other side, or selected sectors breaking down? Okay or maybe more than selected sectors, or quite a few sectors breaking down, or the indices setting up its sell patterns. Okay, do you have a bow tie in the S&P off all-time highs? Eh, you know, last time it happened, the market only dropped 8 10%, but it still dropped nonetheless. Okay, and what is the database saying? Do you have a plethora of buy setups, or do you have a plethora of sell short setups? And again, I tell the story over and over again, but the market was making new highs in 2007, just kind of marginally in the S&P, but it was all-time highs, and I couldn't find a long setup to save my life, and every stock and their brother was set up as a short. I actually apologized to my clients. I know we're at new highs. I know it kind of goes against the grain, but here's a short that's set up. I'm, I'm seeing tons of them. Let's just see what happens. Okay, oh, that would work. Oh, another would work. Another would work. And before you do it, we got stopped out of our longs. And we we're 100% short going into 2008. Well, halfway through 2008, you know, BD's like, oh, we had a bear market. Didn't see that coming. It's like, how could you not see it coming? The database produced nothing but shorts from late 2000, late October 2007. The indices, I think you had a weekly bow tie down. We could check it in a minute. But we had like a weekly bow tie in the S&P right around the end of the year 2007, right around the end of the year, beginning of the year 2008. So the signs were there. So if the signs are there, the signs are there. But don't make any drastic decisions. Just kind of like slowly start letting things get stopped out and slowly start putting things on. Okay, well, you don't have any control of getting it stopped out, but you have control on putting things on. Okay. All right, a couple of announcements. Um, the store is here at dayoflander.com. I am um, upgrading software and all the people who are on the trading service already. Uh, if you want to be part of the beta testing, and I've got a, I got like four or five emails this morning, so thank you guys for that. Uh, if you want to be a part of the beta testing or the uh, service, let me know. I might even open up a few trials for that too. So if you want to be in a trial for the beta testing, um, uh, let me know, and we'll um, I'll bug you. I won't bug you too much, but I'll bug you a little bit. Uh, this offer has ended, so let me just scratch this out. Uh, IPO course still available. Obviously, stock selection course still available too. Let's see my website for more than that. All right, we've got. I've gone long enough. Let's um. Let me see if there's any questions that aren't specific stock questions, and then uh, I'll take care of those. I'll take a look at. Let's take a look at the markets, and then let's um. We'll open it up for individual questions. Um. Just by chance, the stock happens to be up. I have probably the portfolio up. This is the portfolio. Um, and somebody asked me last night, is this, uh, are there any stocks in the portfolio that are still set up uh, because they're just com coming into the service? They're a, an old client coming back in. Uh, and my answer was, yeah, this Ruby looks uh, pretty good in here. So you got a nice little breakout, nice little pullback. I think we got in back here somewhere. but um, And it, it did pan out great right away. It gave us a, uh, what do you call that, a dead money report. It looks like it's set up again, but I wouldn't give it too many more days in the pullback uh, for a new position, okay? Now, I'm going to, uh, okay, we'll get back to this. Um, yeah, we'll get to, the, Spitty, we'll get to that question. We'll get to the stocks, um, but I see it kind of relates to what we just did. Okay, let's take a quick look at the overall market, and then I want to, um, 
Let me clean this watch list up. We'll look at a few sectors, and then we will hop out to individual stocks and uh, take your stock questions. In fact, you guys want to start asking about stocks, I can start asking right now. Uh, just to ask about one stock at a time, if you don't mind. Uh, that way, <clears throat> I can get to your question and then delete it. Um, it's kind of interesting. The headlines last night were end of the world. So what happens today? P's are up 1% so far, okay? So it turns out to be a pretty good day when last night they announced end of the world. So don't get too caught up in all that stuff. What's disappointing about the P's is... We were stuck in a rage. We broke out of the rage, and I've been—I was preaching to everyone. Geez, guys, I sure would like it if this market would clear this rage much more decisively. And unfortunately, it did. It came right back in. Well, anytime you come back into a rage, all bets are off. Now, let's take a look at one thing here. Uh, let's put the 50-day moving average in. Okay, I'm sorry, that's a 200. Well, the 200 is relevant too. The 200 is down around 2,000, which is down towards the bottom of the range. And like I said in the column two days ago, um, a lot of times technicals come together at the same spot, okay? So let's put a 50-day moving average in. And there's nothing magical about the 50-day moving average, but it can help to keep you on the right side of the market, okay? Now, you can see, I've got an open window somewhere. Um, you can see that we're back above the 50-day. Nothing magical about that. But one thing in markets, you don't necessarily want to buy when a market crosses the 50-day or any moving average for that matter. But if it can stay above it for a while, and daylight's a good thing to use, okay? Notice that you're above the 50-day moving average back here, and there's daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. If there's daylight, then it might be worth a shot, okay, as far as a trend is concerned. Or you know that the trend might still be in place. Now, sometimes you get a little dip below, and then it throws right back up, a little throwback. Okay, but for now, though, we are within the trend. It's not like the 50 days doing this, the price just came down, touched it. I can't really do it in here. Touched it and then went on like that, okay? We have come back into this trading range. So until we get out of the trading range, I, would, uh, I wouldn't get too excited about the S&P, at least in and of itself, okay? So, of course, stuck in that range. And if you go back to um, November, you could see that we had a uh, – we really haven't made any forward progress since November, okay? So that's uh, that's somewhat concerning. Okay, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Now, the NASDAQ, as you can see, had a really nice breakout, and then it's come back in a little bit. But so far, it's only pulled back. Well, obviously, with a pullback, it's got to stop sometime, okay? So if it keeps pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, it goes back into the prior range, then, like the P's, all bets are off. But so far, so good. It's pulled back, and as you can see, it's still well above its 50-day moving average. Again, there's nothing magical about that, but again, it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Okay. Now, let's take a look at the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 has come back into its range, but then yesterday what happened? Something interesting. The overall market's still looking a little iffy, bases the P's, and even the NASDAQ has come back in quite a bit, so that's kind of a little scary. But then the Russell yesterday, and this is why you have to look at everything, and this is why every day I look at two to 3,000 stocks, okay? And the reason I do that is so I get a good feel for what's really going on within the market. Now, in this particular case, 
you really have to look no further than the Russell 2000 because yesterday the Russell, what did the Russell do yesterday? Russell was up a little bit more than half a percent. Okay. Yeah, it's back down in its range here, but it came back up a half a percent and change, or 0.6%, whatever it is. Okay, and it erased the prior days, well, not all the prior days' losses, but still was a good day nonetheless. And it's back right above the range, or right at the top of the range, and it's not that far from all-time highs. Let's measure that just for S&Gs. Okay, 2%, less than 2% away from all-time highs. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy this market, but it's not as bad as the media might suggest or maybe as the P's look, okay? Because here's a market came back in its range, and all of a sudden it's trying to get out of its range. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy it, okay? But this gives you a clue that things might not be that horribly bad just based on this stock in and of itself, okay? now. Today, so far so good. We're up about a percent. Well, a big percent exactly. Okay, looks like we're getting a little tiny rally as we speak in it. Okay, let's not watch the micro too much. That'll get you in a lot of trouble. But if we measure from there to there, now we're less than one percent away from all-time highs. Okay, so a couple things. Uh, if the market's above the 50-day moving average, then err on the side of where the market is, provided it's not just kind of touching it or whatever. If it's stayed up there for a while. If the market is close to new highs, then air on the long side, okay? But when every, time, every time something gets a little iffy, make sure you are in the right stocks to begin with, okay? Now, let's take a look at some of these areas in here in no particular order. Uh, some of these areas, like the chemicals, came up, made new highs, and then they came all the way back in below their breakout level. So that kind of scores as a bummer. The energies have gone down and tested their old lows. I was bullish on energies. I might be wrong there, okay? But he who fights and runs away lives the fight another day. I was also bullish on gold. Let's take a look at the metals and mining first. You can see metals and mining have come down and tagged their old lows in here. I thought we had a bottom in gold. We had a bow tie. It looked pretty good. And some of the stocks that I took out of my momentum list because they lost momentum, some of them were up fairly significantly, 10, 20, 30 percent, okay? Uh, we lost money in the gold trade that we took, uh, on, within the service at least. But some of those stocks actually did take off, so I wasn't completely wrong, okay? Not that I made money. So, again, being right versus making money rears its ugly head. Uh, ditto for silver. But I do think these markets, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the next day, but I do think eventually they'll come down here and bottom out. And what we'll do is we'll wait for them to set up again as a bow tie, and then we'll take a look at it. Uh, conglomerates and some of these big cap issues at high levels are looking a little iffy in here, although today they're doing okay. Uh, durables sort of look a little iffy, a little support down here, but they pulled back to the prior breakouts. Non-durables, kind of interesting. Non-durables has been in a slide, and so has food and beverage. Okay, and those are two defensive areas. So we're not seeing a flight to safety, at least not just yet. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Okay? I think when, when all other stocks sell off, except for those defensive issues, that tells me that there's a repositioning, a rebalancing at place. Okay? Banks rallied up, looked like they were rolling back over. Now they're trying to rally a little bit today. So I don't know if they're out of the woods just yet, but one of my concerns with the banks have been that they, if they do break down, they've got a long ways to go. But so far, so good. And sure, it's another one of those areas that's pulled back into its rage, okay? But having a decent day today. So even though they pull back into the rage, maybe they can bust right back out. Uh, real estate and utilities are two interest-sensitive, interest easy for me to say, interest-sensitive areas, and they've been imploding as of uh, late. In fact, while we're talking about those areas, let's take a look at bonds. And bonds have been imploding as of late. Now, the good thing is they have rallied up, but now, once again, it looks like they're imploding. Now, what's interesting in bonds, and I find this absolutely fascinating, is that nobody really gave a flip about the fact that rates – went up, bonds went down, okay, until for some reason 
Friday comes along, and bam, bonds drop, and then everybody just freaks out. Market sells off hard. Well, the good news is we shot right back up. So, yeah, rates have made a quantum leap higher, but they haven't changed in what? Almost a month, okay? So it's not a route lower, at least not just yet there. The good news is there is a silver lining in some of this, or uh, I wouldn't say a silver lining, some good areas. Drugs, generic drugs, biotechnology, uh, anything or most anything health service related, as you can see so far, so good in here. Remaining at longer term uptrends and not too far away from all time highs. Uh, within defense, there's some selected issues. I saw some IPOs that are actually banging on new highs in the defense area, so that might be worth a look. And take a look at retail. So far, so good. Longer term uptrend remains intact. Uh, hardware, not so good. Okay. Take a look at software. Eh, pull back into its prior range. So it's getting a little mixed out there. Some areas are still trending, but yeah, it's getting a little mixed out there. So you might want to be careful. Uh, be careful means be selective. Wait for entries. We've been looking to enter a stock for two weeks, and it has not triggered. Okay? So we did not take the trade. Now, if it doesn't trigger today, I'll probably take it off the radar. So we've avoided a potential bad trade just by waiting for an entry. So I'm always amazed at how important waiting for entries is. And whenever the market gets a little iffy, that waiting for entries makes a huge difference. Now let's take a look at let's go take let's go ahead and open it up for stock. Let me get this question out the way. Smitty says, Dave, I wanted to ask about FLWS. All right, let's pull it up. And Smitty goes on to say, by the way, this one was on the Landry list. If you come in here and look at the Landry list, what was yesterday, the 11th? Where is it? There it is right there. Landry list. Yay. Okay. Market seems in a pullback so far and sector also. Okay. Well, if you really like the setup, then take it. Okay. I also want to know if you would place your order just above what appears to be TKO, depending on how deep it is. Well, in this particular case, we talked about this one actually last week. And if it was a little bit deeper, I would say textbook manner would be okay, above the high and below the low. And I forget why. I didn't, I didn't, this would, it jumped out of me as a great setup, but the reason I didn't take it, I guess, was because I guess I wanted a little bit more uh, knockout into TKO, okay? So just let me talk through it, and then I'll look at the rest of your question. I think I said last week, if you did take the trade, your stop would be a little bit further below the TKO because it wasn't, I'd like to see almost a little bit more knockout move. And I think the reason I said that was based on the magnitude of the move. Yeah, you have almost... 100% run in here, or 80% run. So I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move to knock out a few more players. All right, now let's read the rest of your question. Okay, I also want to know if you place an order just above what appears to be a TKO. Yeah, you could, yeah, because the, the close isn't like right here. The close is down a little bit, okay? And it's already made an intraday recovery. So, yeah, your entry would be above that TKO. So it would be triggering today. Okay, it's not a bad setup. I mean, the only reason I, I sort of look for perfection. Like I said, the longer you're in this business, the more selective you get, and the less trades you'll take. Okay. And if that TKO would have been a little deeper, I probably would have went after it. Okay, I would put a buy in about twelve ninety. Uh, yeah, it looks plausible just eyeballing it. And eleven fifteen. No, I would actually go a little bit lower than eleven fifteen. I would go below the TKO because it's not a massive knockout. Take a look at, like, uh, was it CLDX or CTLT, one of these stocks. This one was a TKO. I forget. Was it this one? I think it was this one. Yeah, this is a TKO that comes to mind, one of my favorite ones of uh, whatever year that was. This is one that needs to be studied over and over again. But in a case like this, if I can find the uh, the setup, where your TKO is nice and wide, then you want to, then it's okay to trade it in more of a textbook manner. And if it ever gets there, 
Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, here's a – this is what I like a TKO to look like. The FLWS is not bad, but this one's almost to a point where it's extreme. And in a case like this, you can say, okay, I'm going to put in my entry right here, and I'm going to put in my stop right here, trade it almost in a mechanical slash textbook sort of fashion, okay? But, again, the FLWS, that knockout wasn't quite as big, okay? I go on and on. Stock shows some acceleration. W yeah, yeah, everything's great about the stock. Stocks inside the sector seem to be climbing out and breaking out to the upside. Some pullbacks, what do you think? Yeah, every, uh, your analysis is very well thought and is very good. The only thing, again, is that it, it ran up about 100% or round numbers, a little bit less, I guess. And I just would have preferred to see more of a knockout move, okay? Um, and you ask yourself, can I walk away and be okay? And the market got a little iffy in here. So I was like, you know, it's not the greatest setup. It's out uptown. Although it doesn't look bad, it's just missing that one little characteristic. So I passed. Okay. All right. James wants to know about TSS. TSS. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, it looks like it's lost some acceleration, though. It kind of ran up in here, and then it just sort of did this here. Uh, what's this run up here? This run up here was 10%, and let's see what this run up here was, just for S and G's. That run up was 5%, okay? Um, it comes with a little time of looking at charts, and if you're not, if you don't have the gift right away, don't worry about it, because you'll get it, but when, I, I, it, when you first see this chart, you're like, oh, wow, it looks great. It's going straight up. But then as you kind of look at it, you're like, wait a minute. I can see where it's lost momentum. It shot up here went like this, and then it went like that, okay? So, and again, James, you're, you have the stock selection course. So go in and rewatch that. And then the other thing to never forget about, and it's all in the course, is that take a look at its prior peak and then take a look at where it is now, okay? And if you want, if you can't just eyeball it, just kind of look at it and say, okay, wait a minute. It went up 1% in uh, two months or a month and a half. That's not a very impressive move. So it's lost some steam in here, kind of picking that one apart. Once. Um, looks like it sort of already triggered it here. So they'd be no trade there. But, yeah, I, I hear you. It took off. It's an IPO. It's pulled back. A little higher price IPOs. I'm not as big a fan of the higher price IPOs. I like it when they come public at lower prices and take off and uh, double and triple from those areas. But, uh, yeah, it's already triggered. It wasn't bad, though. But a couple days ago would have been your entry on that one. Nice instruction. Thanks. Pan W for Mr. Steve. P-A-N-W. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. And I think this one has been on my uh, – look, see, this was on yesterday's list. Look, there it is right there. Okay. So it's not bad. Um, yeah. You know, my only problem – and then I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth because, because is it a viable setup? Yes. The only thing that I kind of see with this stock is, okay, it's already had about a 300%, 400%, 500% run. Uh, one has to wonder what's left in it, but that doesn't mean that you should uh, take the setup, but that's just one of the little voices in the back of your head you should probably uh, think about, okay? Mark, are you in here? I see you've got a question in the email coming in. We could answer that live if you want. Okay. Um, A-R-A-Y for Mr. John. A-R-A-Y. Um, I'm not sure what you're seeing. Let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at it over here, it looks a little bit better. But I'm just seeing a stock that's kind of all over the place, okay? Kind of electrocardiogram type of stock. And, yeah, it did kind of bottom out, but it wasn't off of multi-multi-year of lows. It was off a couple-year lows. I mean, I see that, but for the most part, the personality is pretty pretty crappy in that one. I mean, you know, go 
what was the last one we we're looking at? Pan W. I mean, look at the personality of this stock. It just tends to go up. It's got some zigs and zags in it. It's not perfect. But for the most part, it tends to work its way higher. Whereas that other one, whatever it was, just kind of all over the place. Yeah, it looked pretty good back here. It was doing pretty good. But now it's sort of changed its personality. Now keep in mind that personalities of stocks do change. Okay, and how does it, it's like you kind of see a stock as an entity uh, or as a being with a personality, but it's the people behind the stock that change, I, I, I guess, that changes the personality of stock. So now it's like people are buying and selling and buying and selling and just kind of cancel each other out and chopping all over the place, although it has worked its way higher as of late. Andre wants to know about ROSG. ROSG. One day I'll get the pronunciation of your name properly for your home country. Um, are you in Russia right now? This is what I call a bottle rocket. It went straight up and then it came straight back in. Okay, so I tend to avoid those because when they do that, it, it, it did the same thing back here. They're just hard to trade, so I would leave that one alone. Okay, AVOL. Yeah, AVOL was in the stock, uh, uh, what do you call it? The IPO course. And it, uh, it triggered, and uh, so far so good on that one. That, I almost put that one in, in my list of things for today. I didn't want to jinx it, though, because it hasn't gone that far just yet. But, yeah, that one actually triggered as a breakout, and so far so good. Uh, as a new setup, you might want to let it pull back a little bit more. I'm a little bit more lenient in IPOs. So if it pulls back to about 20, 50, I think it might be worth a shot. It's not going straight up, but it looks okay. A-R-A-Y. we talk about that one? Is that the one we beat to death? Yeah, we beat that one to death. C-A-P-N. <clears throat> um, this one, it's got a little bit of that, um, uh, what do you call it? Bottle rocket look to it, so I think I'd pass on it. It went from two bucks a share to ten bucks a share. That's what five hundred percent. That's a little too much, a little too crazy. Uh, DSCO. Okay. Um, well, it's kind of wide and loose, and has a lot of bad memories along the way. Let's zoom in and see what you're seeing on that. Um, yeah, it's working its way higher, but let it clear all this resistance back here, and then reevaluate that. ARQL. Um, no, it's a little. This is too much of a bottle rocket. Again, it's 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 just going straight up. Uh, let's see. If there's a bow tie in here somewhere. You know, maybe if you'd have caught the bow tie in here. Obviously, here's your bow tie. I would have triggered somewhere in here. If you caught that, that's one thing. But if you missed that, now it's up two, three hundred, four hundred percent. I think it's too late. Uh, but, you know, on a pullback, this tra you know, trading, there's always trade-offs. I mean, it's very dangerous, though. Well, you know what? I probably would have passed to begin with anyway because you've got all this overhead supply here. Yeah. And then you've got this huge gap way back here. Yeah, so that's just that's a stock that needs to be left alone. CAPN. We, talk, we just talked about that one, right? CAPN. Yeah, we did. CYTX. Uh, well, first thing jumps out of me with CYTX. Massive, 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 massive amount of overhead supply. A lot of trading in the stock between that range. So anyone who bought that range obviously will be looking to get out at break even should the stock get up to that level. So that's the first thing that jumps out at me. Now let's zoom in a little bit. And if you even if you were playing like the little breakout pullback first thrust in here. It's already triggered. It's come back in, so I'd leave that one alone. Plus, obviously, it's a penny stock too. When I'm, when is that Wendy's? I'm probably not gonna like it. Ah, better than I thought it would look. Um, no, never forget about your debt debt change. Okay, so it's going up like three uh, percent, and if you change the days on here, it's actually down three percent in a month and a half, six weeks. So in six weeks, it's lost three percent of its value. Let's put the bow ties in. Okay, and you know sometimes if you can't figure it out, throw the bow ties in and see what's going on there. Notice that they're all kind of coming together. 
this could actually turn into a short. I don't know if you want if you want to short it. Yeah, it looks like it could be a short soon. Looks like a bit of a pioneer type of short at this point. But you don't want to be buying it now. John says now. Uh, no, uh, it pulled back. Yeah, you know, kind of a little breakout here. Pulled back. It just really didn't set the world on fire. Okay. Um, kind of pulls back and then comes in a little bit and it's kind of and then it pulls almost all the way back to its prior breakout in here and then again let's take a look at that net net thing um, a couple days ago let's see what we got you know what do we have here uh, one six weeks six weeks of sideways trading okay that's one of the simplest things out there but I'm amazed at how many times people don't see it right off that the net net move of something tree okay well this is a little on the thin side given the price of the stock but not incredibly thin when you couldn't trade it uh, I don't like it made this one big bar up and then it just went sideways and now it's breaking out again maybe on pullbacks but it's kind of all over the place. It doesn't have a whole lot of structure. It did in the past, well, a little bit. It did kind of work its way higher, consolidate, work its way higher, consolidate. But then you had this huge quantum leap, leap higher. It gave back almost all of it. It did give back all of it. And then it's just going to take it off again. This might be one of those stocks that, that just makes a big jump on earnings and then it's impossible to get on one way or the other. HRTX, never heard of it. HRTX. Yeah, it's a little on the thin side, but I hear you. The only thing I don't like is you have all these multiple peaks in here. But let's zoom in and see if it's worthwhile in and of itself. It's not bad. It did run up 100% in here, but I would wait for it. I would wait for a knockout move, maybe down to as low as 12 before going after it. Again, I don't like all these peaks back here. So that would probably turn me off on the stock because it probably is going to, it well, it probably, but it might run into a little trouble at that prior peak. So I would pass just based on that. But put it this way, if I was just seeing this right here, that's that looks like a good stock. So this makes for a wonderful example. Okay, what do we have? We have persistency. Notice that it tends to go up day after day after day. And then you could pretty much draw a line through most of the bars in here. Let's get an actual um, linear regression to put in here and, and just see what happens. Let's start right here and bring it on up. Yeah, see, their line's pretty close to my line. Okay, this is the, let me just change the color of mine or whatever. Well, you get the idea. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is that it does look like it has some acceleration to it okay so you can see these trend lines and I know I kind of didn't draw this one perfect but let's just do this extend this one out these trend lines are for the most part accelerating higher and then notice the last move here from this from this close to this close so it sort of took off in here and now it's pulling back but it's got to pull back significantly based on the run in here so if all I was seeing was this I'd be all over this like if this was an IPO and we didn't have any bad memories back here, I think it'd be a wonderful setup, or could be a wonderful setup, if it pulled back more. And if you wanted to take it for a swing trade, I certainly couldn't fault you on that. But when you back it way out, it just, it's got a little electrocardiogram look to it, and you're also dealing, again, with these multiple peaks. So that's why I probably would not take that one. EBIX, that's one I do know. Um... And it, it, longer term, again, you got multiple peaks. It's wide and loose. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. Well, notice your breakout is just one bar. Okay. Now I I haven't figured out how to trade box stocks like Darvis style, but this does look like a box stock. The only the only way I figured out to trade box stocks is to look for one of my patterns, get in them, and then hang on. Let's take a look at the portfolio, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Portfolio. Okay. Yeah, take a look at like CTLT. You can see that I think it triggered back here and then it turned into a box. Then it makes a quantum leap higher. It turns into a box. So my only way to trade these box stocks is to get in on one of my setups, such as a pullback. 
And I think, uh, well, Trill hadn't worked out yet, but Trill has the potential to be a box stock now. So, uh, and then there's too many days of this pullback, okay? And it's almost pulled back all the way to this parlor breakout. If you're long, stay long, but there's nothing really there for me. Let me see, we've got an email over here coming in. Let me see if it's about the stock. Hey, Dave, I got stopped out of USO. Stop was set at 750. He should not have gotten stopped out of that. Let's take a look at that. USO is the one we, we talked about. A little discretion there. Um, he must mean 1750, okay? Well, now it's coming down. It's re that stop once again, okay? So you got a discretionary thing. Say, so, okay, well, let's just, let's just see if it gets through and it keeps on going. And if it does, when it gets to about right here, we'll go ahead and exit. We lost a little bit more than we intended if it gets hit at that level. But so what? Because if you catch one or two that turn into big winners, turn around and go to big winners, then then it's all it's worth your while. It's worth that little risk. So this risk here, this little added risk here, is worth it because you might turn around and it might go up like that. So this might be ten times or a hundred times or a thousand times more than this added risk. But yeah, it's coming right back in. So he says in the future, I should set a stop a little under your stop so it gets stopped out a few cents above the move. Well, unfortunately, okay, he says, in the future, should I set the stop a little under your stop so it gets stopped out for a few cents move? Well, you could put an airbag in, again, which is much lower than my stop, or you could put, and I should say, and you should put in a um, an alert, okay? Marco keeps the, keeps those big jets in the air, so God bless him for doing that. Um, <laughs> it, you, definitely want, you definitely want the smart guy working on a plane, right? So, yeah, if it gets hit again, then, um, then you get out. Uh, but, no, you can't say uh, if Dave stops at 9, I'm going to place mine at 8.59. Um, I think, in general, you can't do that. But you can put in an airbag if, you, if you've got to be busy uh, fixing that plane, I didn't have an alarm go off. Fixing, I guess repairing would be a better word. I'm not sure I want somebody to fix the plane. I'm fixed the plane. <laughs> I got all these extra parts left over. I'm not sure what to do with them. CYTX? CYTX. Yeah, we talked about this one already, didn't we? Um, it is It is really uh, spec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about that. Too much overhead supply. Plus, it's a penny stock. Okay. DXCM as a short. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Well, first of all, it's health services, okay? And in general, health services have, have been doing fairly well. Let's, um, let's plot the sub-industry if we get it to come up. If I could find my... Uh, the problem is I have to keep all these windows open. I can never find anything. Here we go. Uh, let's let's see what the sub industry is doing. Oh goodness, that's a problem with having all these windows open. I got to keep a go to wind webinar window open, and let's see if we can make this happen. All right, where did my window go? All right, let's do it again. Let's try it again. Talk amongst yourselves. Here we go. Let's make the comparison vi visible. And let's make the comparison the sub-industry. Oops. Let's see how we do this. It's been so long since I've done this. I forgot how to do it. I can't do it on the fly. Here we go. Plot. If we plot the sub-industry comparison, okay, this is the sub-industry, and it, it's not fantastic, okay, fantastico, but it's not bad. And if we take out, let's take out the chart real quick and make that black, okay. So your sub industry is doing this, and I used to in my older charts. If you ever watch these shows, you'll notice that I always had the sub industry on the chart. 
But now I don't do that. I go look at the sub industry later. I just want to see the pure chart. And and you kind of I've kind of evolved that way. But I think early on it's nothing wrong with uh with plotting that sub industry underneath. But I just know and that's the other thing too, because I'm looking at those sub industries anyway, I already know which sub industries are or what industries are trending and which ones are not. So if we plotted the let's plot the actual industry itself. Okay. Let's try it one more time. Okay, so if you plotted the whole industry itself, it looks even better. So you can see, I mean, it's not perfect, but it is in the trend. So first of all, you're swimming against the tide when you go to short this, and it really hasn't broken down that much. But, yeah. To interview myself, is it losing steam? Absolutely. Okay, I don't think I'd rush out and short it just yet because one, you're swimming against the tide, and that's probably the number one thing. Now, every now and then, I'll see a setup within a sector, and it looks fantastic, and the sector still headed higher. But yeah, you could get a bow tie in here soon, and it might be worth a shot after a bow tie. But just realize that you're kind of going against against the tide at least so far. Okay. Okay, any more questions? I think we have. Oh, we're out of time. All right, last one for Ethan, CRDM. Do you have your symbol right on that? CRDM, you sure? It's not coming up. Let's try one more time. CRDM. Okay. Well, um, Ethan, if you can type it in real quick, I could. Uh, I'll, I'll pull it up. But if if it's uh, if not, it's not on my system, unless it's a penny stock or something. Well, look, uh, we're up after uh, we're past an hour and a half, and that's normally the time we need to shut things down in order for recording to take. Uh, as you know, I love doing these shows. I have a blast doing them, as you can tell. I'm trying to get a little wound up. Uh, and but there is no show without you, so I appreciate you guys showing up and girls. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again, and hopefully I'll see all you guys again uh, next week. Uh, again, everybody have a fantastic weekend, and see you next week. Thank you so much.